Welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Reed Stone. Alongside me is my co-host, Bob Foley. And our guest today is Bradley Jensen. Brad began his professional career as a spiritual advisor, serving as a youth director, hospital chaplain, and Lutheran pastor for nearly 20 years. He transitioned to a role as a financial advisor, where he has served for over 20 years and currently is a financial advisor with Lake Superior Financial Services in Duluth, Minnesota. As a financial advisor, Brad holds the following credentials. He's a certified financial planner, a certified investment management analyst, an accredited investment fiduciary, and a charter chartered advisor in philanthropy. Brad's core value is healthy longevity. His goal is to live to the age of 110, he intends to cut back to part-time work when he turns 95 in 2051 and to continue working for the rest of his life. He also shares his experience with and his knowledge of longevity planning with other financial advisors. He does this as an author of the book, Join the Longevity Revolution, a guide for financial advisors and their clients, and the forthcoming book, Longevity Coaching for Financial Advisors. Brad, welcome. Thank you. We're happy to have you on the show today to talk uh, talk more about the books and the work you're doing with financial advisors in this whole space that is becoming longevity planning. So I wanted to cover, as I went through and put together your bio, one of the things that, that jumped out to me, and Bob and I have coached a lot of people in this kind of the same transitional period where they'll do a career and have a very successful career for a long period of time, and then they'll trans transition to a new career. So tell us a little bit about that transition from being a pastor and all of the different roles that that involves to being a financial advisor and maybe how some of that experience helped you become a financial advisor. Very good. Um, I was a Lutheran pastor for about 20 years. And at age uh, 46 is when I made my transition to financial services. And uh, why would I do that? Well, I really did enjoy my years in the ministry. I started right out of college as a youth director. And then uh, during my seminary training, I was a hospital chaplain and then a parish pastor. I'd served two rural churches, and then came to Duluth and served Kenwood Lutheran Church in Duluth for 14 years. And I had a really good run there and a really good relationship with the people, the leaders, and so on. But I really reached a point where I thought uh, I needed a second act, an encore career. Mm -hmm. And it became clear to me immediately what that would be. It was basically a transition from being a spiritual advisor to a financial advisor. And the skill set that I had as a pastor, I did have some counseling training as a pastor. Uh, I went through a two-year program in gestalt therapy. And those skills uh, helped uh, really well as I translated my work into financial services. Uh, and so that, that was really the impetus for that. And there's a couple of the quick practical pieces. My wife and I built our dream home north of Duluth, Minnesota on four acres of beautiful wooded land. And we're kind of planted here in the Duluth community. She finished her PhD and became tenured up at the University of Minnesota Duluth. So Duluth was our home and it just was a natural thing rather than to try to find another congregation in Duluth where some of my current parishioners might go to the new church where I was serving. It was just a natural thing for me to do to make this transition. It worked really well. Perfect. So one of the other things I'm, I noticed as I was putting your bio together is that lifelong learning has been important to you. And it's important, I think, in this whole longevity planning topic that we're going to explore. So tell us a little bit about you know your thoughts on continued learning and how, how that ties into longevity planning. Yes, well, 
there is so much in financial services, as you know, that keeps changing. The markets certainly do and the economy. And also financial planning changes. And uh, that did lead me into my interest in longevity planning from uh, financial planning or retirement planning. But I really felt that there was these, these opportunities for professional training in these various designations where I could continuing, continue my education in that way. And so I did uh, through those designations. And in fact, there's one I just finished this summer that I forgot to mention to you. I, I finished the uh, certified senior advisor designation. Okay. And that was a okay. good complement with longevity. Mm-hmm. So I worked steadily at uh, continuing education through my over 20 years now in financial services. And I very much am excited about continuing to do that. And I took that up another level when I got involved in this book on longevity. Good, good. The other thing I noticed when I was reading your bio, putting it together is that you have this core value of healthy longevity and you, you're really specific about your goals, that your goal is to live to age 110. You're going to cut back to part-time work when you turn 95. You have the year, and then you want to continue working the rest of your life. So before we dive into really more of what's in the book, talk about how your planning on what you want to do the rest of your life, how work is involved in that ties into this whole topic of longevity planning. Sure. I began to believe that I could become a centenarian when I did research through the uh, Longevity Leaders World Congress that meant during COVID uh, virtually twice I attended in 2020 and 2021 when I I met some of the world's top scientists in biotechnology and geroscience that were seriously talking about uh, how longevity would be extended from what we know as the average lifespan now to uh, beyond age 100. In fact, The Economist on September 28th came up with an article titled, Living to 120 is Becoming an an Imaginable Prospect. Efforts to Slow Aging are Taking Wing. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought, I can adopt healthy habits that can take me so far. And I think that with my health regimen as it is now, I could live in a healthy way to my late 80s or early 90s. It's going to take the the promises of advancements in science that's going to be the thing that's going to take me the rest of the way, assuming that they will come. And I've become convinced that they are indeed on the way. And so a couple of extra decades of healthy living is something that uh, geroscience and biotechnology will be delivering to us in the next 10 to 20 years. So considering that, I thought, I don't wanna be retired for all that time. Between age 65 and age 100, there are 12,700 days or over 200,000 waking hours. I wanna be productive in that way. Now I honor anybody that wants to get involved in volunteer activities and things like that. We need that. But I am so interested in continuing on in this profession as a financial advisor and one who specializes in longevity planning that I cannot conceive of myself ever quitting. I can conceive of myself cutting back when I'm in my mid-90s. I think Charlie Munger is 98 now. Maybe he's uh, yeah. cut back <laughs> and Warren Buffett is 93. Uh, I'll never be as wealthy as those guys, nor do I aspire to be. But I do aspire to have my mind and I want to be involved in a productive way uh, for the rest of my life. Now, we, now you, you've talked about um, your physical health. Yes. How do you want to keep your mental health uh, in, uh, in, in, in good stead? Very good question. I am an avid reader. Uh, and more than that, I'm a researcher. And I didn't say this earlier, but uh, whereas I no longer believed I had a vocation or a calling to serve as a parish pastor, I am a trained theologian. 
And I have continued to do research in theology, and that keeps my mind sharp. I just finished a book uh, called, a uh, co-authored book, uh, called uh, uh, Bach's St. John Passion for the 21st Century. It's a two-hour uh, musical production that Bach did in 1724. We're coming up on the 300th anniversary of that, that uh, event. And I partnered with a musicologist, and uh, we got this book that's actually going to be published uh, and available as of the 15th of October. And we got uh, the world's top Johann Sebastian Bach scholar, uh, Christoph Wolf, uh, emeritus professor of music at, at Harvard, who wrote the uh, foreword for the book. So that's exciting, but that took a great deal of research and uh, kept my mind uh, active in evenings and on weekends to get that research done for my part of the book. And I'm constantly working on writing projects, uh, even beyond uh, the area of longevity. So that's what work does it for me. A lot of people do crossword puzzles. They do different things, uh, learn another language. There are so many ways to keep one's mind active, but that's my way. It's, it's research and writing and reading. So you're headed to Broadway. <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not headed to Broadway. Uh, there, there is a small niche of interest in Baroque music, uh, but there is worldwide interest. And so there are 300 Johann Sebastian Bach festivals and societies around the world. And our publisher is a global publisher, and hopefully they'll get the book out there. Uh, so that'll be some fun. That's great. That's uh, that's terrific. What 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 specific advice do you have for people when when you say you want to live to be 110? I'm sure you get a lot of oh come on. Uh, what 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 makes you absolutely convinced uh, that you can accomplish this? Well, and indeed, it is the scientific side. A couple quotes I think will be helpful. Dr. Michael Roizen, who is the Emeritus uh, Wellness Coordinator at the Cleveland Clinic, just wrote a book, Cracking the Longevity Code. Mm -hmm. And Mike's one-liner that's really worth uh, latching on to is by the year 2030, 90 will be the new 40. That is astounding. Wow. That is wow. seven years away. There's another one from um, uh, Dr. Ken Dykewald of AgeWave. And Ken said he sits on a number of boards with gerontologists who tell him that in the next 10 to 20 years, living to 120 uh, can become the norm. I think I might be shortchanging myself 10 years by shooting for 110. <laughs> but I realized that uh, I could end up with cancer, I could have a heart attack, a stroke, anything can happen. You could have the best health habits in the world and have something happen. But I'm playing a long game, and I want it to be uh, a, a life that is not only meaningful and purposeful, but also has a large measure of happiness and psychological richness to it. I integrate those into the goals exercise later in the book. But I think those three areas, happiness, meaningful purpose, and psychological richness, that's what's going to make life worth, worth living from now, hopefully for me, until the until the year 2066. Absolutely. Read back to you because I know you have a few more questions. So how, when you came up with the idea for doing the longevity revolution, Brad, tell us a little bit about the genesis of that book, how it came together. I know there's two other authors. We've had John Comer on previously to talk about this topic. Um, so tell us a little bit about how the book came together. Sure. In uh, 2018, I got reconnected with Dr. James Gamboni, who wrote a fascinating book in, in, in right around the turn of the millennium, uh, even before longevity was called longevity. It was called Refirement, A Boomer's Guide to Life After 50. He redid that book in 2011 uh, and, and it was titled Refire Your Life. And what he asked me uh, as a certified financial planner is would I be interested in partnering with him for really an updated book as we're now coming into the 2020s and it was uh, Dr. Gamboni that came up with the title of the book, uh, Join the Longevity Revolution. He wanted to get away from Refire Your Life 
which is all present in the new book. It's all about refinement, uh, being excited about the next phase of, of, of life. And uh, so I really credit him for giving uh, the impetus for this project. And then we brought John Comer on board. And uh, the three of us, I think, have made a good team. Uh, but Jim, without question, was our visionary that got the project started, gave the book its title, and uh, he's quite a creative guy. So if you do get a chance to interview him, I think you'll find it as an excellent opportunity. Yeah, de definitely. We'll have to have him on. So give us an just a, an overview of the high level overview overview of the book. Sure. Briefly, the book starts, of course, we did get a uh, foreword from uh, Dr. Joseph Coughlin from the MIT Age Lab. So getting that forward was huge. Dr. Coughlin is one of the world leaders in, uh, in longevity. And so getting him to write the foreword was really, really helpful. I think he was interested in doing so because we actually put into practice what he had suggested, which was moving from retirement planning to longevity planning. And in fact, mm -hmm. that's the title of the first chapter. Uh, and what does that entail? Well, it does entail a vision for a longer, healthier life. It entails rethink, doing some rethinking about how long one would want to work for income in life, either out of need or out of desire. And then thinking seriously about purpose and about uh, education. That's chapter one. Chapter two is titled uh, Understanding Juvenescence for Your Longevity Journey. Juvenescence is an interesting term. It kind of combines growing older and growing older in one term. And this actually comes from the ancient Romans, but they had no hope for extending longevity like we do now. But for them, it meant kind of recapturing a sense of vitality about, of life uh, as one grows older. And uh, in that chapter, we do talk more about thinking through either a traditional retirement or a non-traditional retirement. Either will work as long as people are dialed in on their either their uh, single purpose or their what we call a purpose portfolio, have their values well in place and have a good plan for living a longer life. Don't necessarily have to work if they don't need the income. Chapter three is about uh, longevity values, core values for longevity. Some are prescriptive because they're so important that you just have to have them if you're going to join the longevity revolution. Two in particular are healthy longevity. Not surprising. You can't join the longevity revolution and think about being a centenarian, a healthy centenarian, without having uh, healthy longevity as a functional value in one's life. You care about what you eat. You care about your exercise. You care about your the health of your mind and so on. Um, and the other one, which makes sense, is that if you're going to aspire to be a healthy, happy centenarian, you need to have sufficient financial resources for the 100 plus year life. Those are those are prescriptive values, got to have them. There's a few others, but then there are the descriptive values that we, we all each have that are maybe unique to us. But we do think that you move, you know, from from uh, deciding that you want the longer life to thinking about your, your purpose, to thinking about values. And then because healthy longevity is so important, chapter four is health habits re regarding longevity. Chapter five is about the importance of intergenerational relationships. And if I'm gonna live to be 100 plus, I'm going to need to value new relationships with younger people. And so it's very important to think through strategies for advancing intergenerational relationships. Now, those all have to do with kind of flourishing longevity. When we get into chapter six, that's about um, planning for help before you need it. And even if I do live the long life that I want to live, at some point, I'm going to need help. Uh, I'd like to think that I won't need much help until after age 100, but you never know but I've got a strategy for getting that help when I need it, where I'm gonna live, where, how I'm gonna get the help and so on. Chapter seven is three parts to longev to a legacy plan. Part one is the traditional planning, the, the work that you do with an attorney, the, uh, the wills, the trusts, the uh, healthcare directives, uh, health care power of attorney, those things. 
Then this part two of, of, of leaving a legacy is an ethical will. And part three is what we call a spirit led legacy. That is to do with stories and important events that happen in a person's life that should be recorded and passed on to uh, future generations. That's chapter seven. Chapter eight is, is uh, mining your wisdom for balanced goal setting. And uh, the Modern Elder Academy is the world's first midlife wisdom school. I attended the Modern Elder Academy. Uh, they've got a great program going in their Baja campus uh, virtually as well. And they're going to have an our campus in the United States uh, near Santa Fe. And uh, staying connected with them is a great idea for advancing one's wisdom for later in life. The balanced goal setting is what I talked about earlier. That has to do with these three categories of goals. One is simply happiness goals. And a uh, happiness goal for my wife and I is to get out to our timeshare in Palm Springs in March when we're sick of the Minnesota winter. Uh, but that's it is a happiness goal and valuable for happiness. We sit by the pool and enjoy ourselves and go for walks and just enjoy the warm weather. It has absolutely nothing to do with psychological richness. If one were to travel for psychological richness, you might want to check with the Road Scholar Program, ROAD, where they travel, and the purpose of the travel is learning. Okay, that's psychological richness. And that third category is meaning and purpose. And uh, to give you an example of that, still using travel, my wife's uh, purpose after she retires, so she would like to write a book about a famous ancestor that she had uh, that came from the um, Hardanger Fjord in, in, in uh, Norway. And so that would be a trip more around meaning and purpose to find out about her uh, heritage, her Norwegian heritage, and her ancestor that came to Minnesota and was caught up in the Dakota conflict and had some family members killed, and she ended up saving... Mm -hmm some of her family and, and, and then some neighbors. And so that's her project, but that gives you an idea about how one can be specific about goals and balance them between happiness, meaningful, purposeful goals and psychological riches. Chapter nine brings it all together. People then come up with their own holistic personal longevity plan. This is my actual plan. And uh, 50 goals for flourishing in the longevity revolution the plan for help before one needs it, and then the, uh, the, the legacy part, which includes my ethical will, my spirit legacy, and I have got my, uh, my attorney work done. So that completes the process for me. So that's the book, and this is a major tool, and uh, that's really what it's all about. So what are your top two goals? My top two goals um, right now that are right in front of me is to finish the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland's uh, coaching certification program, which I start this Friday, and I will finish uh, next May and, and expect to be certified by the International Coaching Federation. And then what's going to become of that is I'm going to use my skills and training uh, also as research to write a book titled Longevity Coaching for Financial Advisors. So those are two big goals. I'm very excited about them. They happen to be fairly near term. They're, they, I expect to, uh, uh, again, complete the training next year. So that really is a one-year goal. The, the book will be a two to five-year goal. And uh, I look to partner with uh, interested financial advisors who want to explore uh, longevity coaching skills and how they can bring them into their practice. What do you think the um, societal and the and the social implications w uh, will be with this whole idea about longevity and much and living for a, a much lo longer period of time? That's a great question, and I really do think it starts with vision. And a lot of people that don't have the vision or living a long, uh, healthy, happy, purposeful, psychologically rich life 
I, I, I'm afraid that their lack of vision is going to lead to more of what we currently expect with aging, which is that they uh, they'll quite frankly, you know, become more frail in their 80s and maybe die, you know, uh, you know, in their mid 80s. That's the risk of not having the vision, not having the purpose, not having the drive for a longer life. Uh, and so uh, it, I, 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 I'm hopefully going to be uh, an evangelist of sorts for longevity because I really, the best thing I can give to people, apart from a, the spiritual benefit of the gospel, I'm, I'm still an ordained minister. The best thing I can give to people is a vision for another healthy 20 years of living. If they catch that vision and do what they need to do to get through an exciting law, uh, holistic uh, longevity planning process and then implement that plan, that is huge. And, and so it can transform society, but it does begin with a vision. People have to catch the vision and uh, we'll see how many people do. There'll be the early adopters, uh, and then there'll be the those that don't adopt so early. But when they get into the 2030s, they might just see that all of these, that many of these scientific advances are coming, and they may at that point rethink and, oh, I've got something going here. I can get in on this, and I can have a longer life and a healthy a life that's longer. And so they'll catch on. I do think that uh, there will be a wave that will follow the science and those that are early adopters can get in on it early and plan for it early. Do you think there'll be a um, conflict or a clash maybe uh, between the religious community and, and, the, and the worldly community uh, over something like this? I don't think it's gonna be the worldly community uh, or religious community versus worldly. Uh, I think it could be more that there's going to be uh, generational problems over the entitlement program. That's where I see the clash coming. Yep. Because sadly, the, the younger people will even benefit more from the longevity revolution. I'm 67, uh, so somebody that's 27 is going to benefit even more than I will. Um, and uh, we do know that there are uh, issues of around the, the, the entitlement system, Social Security, Medicare, that are going to have to be attended to uh, fairly soon, and nobody wants to touch it. And so I think that's where the conflict is coming from. There may be a conflict between wealthier people and less wealthy people, because without a doubt, some of the early therapeutics that are going to be developed by science are going to be expensive, and they may not be available for a while through normal uh, channels of uh, of, uh, of health insurance, so that, that may be there. But I think overall, it's gonna be a great uh, blessing uh, for the world. The world is gonna need more older workers, especially because the birth yeah. rates are, are lower. And so that blessing is gonna be uh, many older workers, many more intergenerational relationships. And, uh, and my hope is that people that do their planning uh, will not have to work by necessity, but but rather they're working by choice and something that really excites them. Brad, I wanna get your thoughts on the topic of, there's there's quite a bit being written about longevity literacy. And, and a lot of times when I read these articles about longevity literacy, it's focused on helping people understand the financial implications of living longer, mm -hmm. but oftentimes it overlooks the fact, again, that if people are going to live to 110 or 120, that they're going to need to work, like you've planned, to 80 or 90. Right. So to me, what, what longevity literacy means is there's a financial component to that, but there's also this, this non-financial or lifestyle component to it that not only do people in their 50s and 60s and 70s need to kind of understand, but I think that same message needs to be translated to these people in their 20s and 30s who are the ones who are going to live to be 120 so that they can start to map out more of a career strategy 
which which is probably going to involve multiple careers. Yes. To get them to understand this. So I don't I guess I just wanted to get your thoughts around this term of financial literacy, because I I think we oftentimes focus too much on just the financial side. As, well, we, as we talk with people, I think that's absolutely true. And. The question, of course, is how, because yeah. there's so much about longevity that that is still kind of a, a niche interest for people. And uh, only something like The Economist can or or bigger publications can kind of bring this into uh, more of a, a cultural awareness. Um, and I do think you, it's absolutely true that the non-financial side of longevity is as important as the financial side. Uh, I really think that, you know, I can speak for myself that my holistic longevity plan is what drives me. And yeah. I, I I think what can help on the um, non-financial side and also help people complete their goals, it's another tool we developed that we that we haven't put on our website yet. On our website is a longevity planning journal. It's the uh, holistic personal longevity plan. But this is what I use in my daily life, and we've got to get this up on the website uh, in, in, in a blank form so people can use it. It's called Join the Longevity Revolution Navigation Chart, and it and it deals with directly with what you're talking about. So there are three parts to the navigation chart. I look at this every day. One is my purposes in life, being a good husband to my wife, Jill, being uh, helping people through advising and coaching on longevity planning. And my avocational purpose is to do research and writing on longevity-related subjects, as well as theological topics. And then there's my values. And that's the whole center section here, growth values and security values. And then my goals, my one-year goals and my two to five-year goals, because they're kind of right in front of me. The interesting thing that happened to me, I used this, I developed this last fall and I had eight goals for 2023. I completed all eight goals by September 30th, and I've still got one quarter of the year <laughs> left. Uh, and I'm gonna and I'm pushing some of the other goals that were two to five into into the one year goals. But the thing that's extraordinary about this is it it it, it talks directly about what you're talking about, Reed, which is the the non financial side. And I yep. do think people need something like a navigation chart to make sure that they wake up every day and they get the mindset of all these things that are important, non-financial. It's the purpose for living. It's the values. It's the goals. And just having that mindset uh, gets my day started in the right direction and gives me direction. And so I, I, it's the bigger issue around trying to get cultural awareness about it, but it gets right down to the individual. What are the tools that each individual has so that they are advancing their purpose, their values, and their goals uh, for an exciting uh, journey in the longevity revolution? Yeah, that's perfect. And and the money, Brad, really just supports all of that non all those non financial goals that you were just talking about. So. If we're pursuing those goals that you have written down, the, the money's going to kind of follow and the, the money supports a lot of those goals. The other yeah. thing I hear a lot of a lot about written about is retirement confidence or retirement readiness. And that's all many times focused just on the financial side too. And I really think that as people approach and get into retirement, we can improve their confidence and their readiness for retirement if they have done this planning on the non-financial side as well as on the financial side. Because now we've got those two pieces. They're clear on both sides of that. They're, what they want to pursue in their life is clear. They know that their money can support what, they're, what they want to do in retirement. And then the third part of that that isn't often talked about, too, is understanding their cash flow. 
do they have do they have enough income coming in to to cover what they want to do and if they can get clear on those three things then i think this retirement confidence this retirement readiness that we often hear about is much clearer for clients at least i i think that's bob what you and i see a lot of times working with clients is we help them kind of clear through and plan for these non-financial aspects kind of assuming not all the time but assuming that they have the financial side kind of under control so yes no i think that's very important and one very practical thing that financial advisors can do is suggested in the book by uh, Andrew Scott and Linda Grattan, The the 100 Year Life. Yeah. And we quote this in the book that people should think of age 100 not, uh, not as a maximum, but uh, the minimum that people should expect. Again, there's no guarantees. But what this can mean practically for financial advisors is they can run uh, some scenarios with kind of the current default, my financial planning software now defaults to 94 for, for women and 92 for men. And you can push that out 10 years and run the Monte Carlo uh, analysis and see how that looks and have that conversation with me. Because if the resources aren't there and they are still working and they like their job, that's a good place to have that conversation. Why not continue it for a while longer? Or why not, if you really like your job, but you don't like uh, to work full-time, how does that look part-time? Or you want to start another career. Grandma Moses became a professional painter at age 78. And she lived to be 100 years old way before the longevity revolution. But one could surmise that her purpose for living, her passion for painting, had a lot to do with those extra years that so many other people did not have. She was born, I think, uh, right after the Civil War and lived to, you know, uh, 1961. So that that that's the power of having purpose. Uh, and uh, and and people and it's it's non-financial, but it does relate to the financial. Yeah, absolutely. I think you covered this a little bit before, Brad, but I. I want listeners and particularly financial advisors to, to think about how they could use the book and the workbook for both themselves and their clients. So tell us a little bit about how they can use the book and the workbook sure. together. Sure. sure. Well, the book, uh, the book is available, of course, up on Amazon. If financial advisors are interested in using it for clients, it sells on Amazon for close to 20 bucks. Uh, they can get in touch with me with the contact information that you've got and uh, say if they want to get, uh, they can get it at half price, 10 bucks a book. Uh, and I can, I can take care of that for them directly rather than going through Amazon. So they can save a lot of money that way. And they can cover 25 of their clients. What we did, so that's one for the, for the book, okay? When we say workbook, we've actually got digital tools. And so those are, are the workbooks, so they're digital. And they're on the Longevity Revolution Press uh, website. They can download those tools, use the book, use the tools to help people get their holistic personal longevity plan done. And then once it's done, the goals, up to 50 goals for flourishing in the Longevity Revolution, to the extent that they really require money to achieve, then that gets built into the financial plan. So to keep it simple for financial advisors, you can get the book at half price. If you order a, a 25, just contact me. I also have now, uh, a we've refined a three session, nine, 90 minutes for three sessions to take people through the book and the whole process of getting a holistic longevity plan done, that they can get by letting me know and I'll give it to them for free. It's a PowerPoint deck and no cost for that. So they, they can get the book for half price, uh, the tools are up on the website and they can get a, uh, a three session PowerPoint presentation that they can use with clients. And I just recently got that through uh, 
my broker dealer. So it's been it's been vetted by one broker dealer, and okay. so yeah. they can they can run that through their own broker dealer and then uh, use it in their in their practice. Okay, excellent, excellent. Brad, is there anything else that you'd like to mention um, before we end today? Bob, any final comments, either of you? I'd just like to, uh, uh, Brad, what do you think the impact will be on how, how do you uh, re regenerate social circles? Um, regenerate social circles. Um, uh, well, as, I, as you age. Uh, as you, oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, actually, uh, the the uh, Bill Kaufman from the uh, Age Lab has created something on the Hartford website about uh, a social portfolio, and he's got a number of great ideas for that. But I do think that what we have to offer in our book is we stress the importance of advancing um, intergenerational uh, uh, relationships, and so. There are a number of ways to do that. You know, you can volunteer to do that. If you're connected with a church or a synagogue or a mosque, you can uh, get involved very easily in youth programs that way. Um, you can volunteer uh, to read at schools for, for younger people. And a lot of it has to do with being intentional. I'm in a Rotary Club. We have junior Rotarians, and so we can build some relationships that way. But then there's also, of course, it, uh, our, our own age groups. And so... Uh, what am I planning on doing? Oh, I'm going to learn how to play bridge. My parents enjoyed that. I'm going to learn how to play it. And I'm going to get involved in bridge clubs and build relationships that way, doing something fun that way. I'm going to get back to golfing. I haven't golfed in a number of years. I'm going to join a, a golf league. Uh, all kinds of ways that you can build relationships uh, as we age. And uh, uh, I'm very much looking forward to adding to my circle of friends uh, the older I get. That sounds great, Brad. Glad to meet you. You as well. Oops. Pull up Brad's uh, contact information here for viewers. And once again, oh, if you're interested, books in, in bulk, let me know, or if you're interested in the slide deck for the uh, three sessions, uh, join the longevity revolution to take clients through uh, the process, let me know. I'm happy to share it with you. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks for joining us, Brad. We enjoyed uh, learning more about that. And I think we're just on the beginning toss of getting this word about longevity planning out to, I think the financial services industry is gonna be on the forefront of this helping clients. I think corporate, the employers are gonna be part of the solution for helping their employees understand what longevity means from a work standpoint. So it's a fascinating topic. Um, and everybody viewing, please reach out to Brad again about the book, about the PowerPoint slides, and uh, contact any of us if you have any further questions. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you guys and uh, enjoyable to uh, talk about this very important topic. Excellent. Thanks for joining us on today's episode, everyone. We will see you next time when we continue exploring retirement and longevity planning beyond the numbers. Yeah.